All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Xander. I'm a developer advocate at Arise AI. And today I've got something very exciting to share with you. Today, you are going to be the very first people to ever use Phoenix, which is our brand new open source ML observability product built for your notebook environment. Here's an overview of what we're going to be covering in today's workshop. I'm going to start out and I'm going to give you an introduction to the concept of ML observability. Then we're going to talk about Phoenix and we're going to, we're going to talk about how Phoenix does ML observability. After that, we're going to jump into the interactive portion of this workshop where you're actually going to get to use Phoenix and try it out for yourself. I'm going to send you a collab link. We're going to download some data from an image classification model, and we're going to try to identify the root cause of a production drift issue. We're going to spend most of our time doing this interactive demo, but near the end, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes and show you a sneak peek of what we've got coming down the line for our support for large language models. And at the very end, uh, if we have time, I'll reserve a minute or two for questions and answers. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the presentation. Let's talk about what is ML observability. ML observability has two parts. Your machine learning system is observable if two things are true. First of all, if you have monitoring. And what that means is the ability to detect issues when they happen in production. And the kinds of issues that we're talking about here are issues like data quality issues. For example, if you're missing a feature in your pipeline. Um, another kind of issue could be a drift issue. And we're going to see an example of a drift issue in a moment. And the third kind of issue could be a performance issue. For example, if your model is um, dipping in accuracy in production, or if you have a, a fraud detection model that has a high false negative rate all of a sudden, you want to know about it. So the ability to detect those issues is what we call monitoring. But when we talk about observable machine learning systems, having monitoring is actually not enough. We don't want to just be able to detect issues. We also want to be able to quickly identify the root cause of the issue. And that's what we call root cause analysis. So the one thing I want you to take away from this slide is that ML observability has two parts, monitoring on the one hand and root cause analysis on the other. All right, so now that we've talked about ML observability at a high level, let's take a look at Phoenix and let's talk about how Phoenix does ML observability. There are three things that I want you to know about Phoenix. The first thing is that Phoenix runs in your notebook environment. And you can see that here on the screenshot on the right, Phoenix is literally running inside of your notebook. Phoenix is an app, it runs, runs on whatever computer, is running your notebook, whether that is your local laptop running a local Jupyter server, whether that's a Colab server running a Colab notebook, Ju uh, Phoenix runs right alongside your notebook. The second thing I want you to know about Phoenix is that Phoenix does monitoring. And you can see that right here. This graph at the top is actually measuring the drift of our production data relative to our training data over time. So this is one example of how Phoenix can do monitoring. Phoenix can help you detect the kinds of issues that we talked about on the previous slide, issues around data quality, drift, or performance. And the third thing I want you to know about Phoenix is that Phoenix helps you pinpoint the root cause of your problems, and it provides workflows that help you fix the issue. And that's what you're seeing down here. We're gonna, we're gonna explore this particular example more in just a minute, but the thing to know right now is that we have in this point cloud our training data in purple, our production data in blue, and you can see right here that Phoenix is actually pinpointing the exact production data points that you need to go take a look at in order to understand what is causing this strict issue. So again, just to reiterate, Phoenix really is ML observability in your notebook because it's giving you both monitoring and root cause analysis in a Jupyter notebook environment. Okay, awesome. So with that introduction, let's go ahead and jump into the interactive portion of the workshop. I've got a link right here that I'm gonna drop in the chat. All right. Everyone see that link? OK, 
people able to see that link in the chat? Okay, I see a, I see it got starred. <clears throat> awesome. Awesome, thanks Maggie. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and follow along with you. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up a new browser tab. I'm going to copy and paste that link that I just sent. And the first thing that we wanna do is let's go ahead and sign in. All right, so I'm gonna sign in here and go ahead and follow along if you're if you're watching at home looks like i've got two factor so i've got my phone right here yes it's me all right so now we're in the notebook i'm signed in the first thing that i want to do is i want to connect to an instance so let's go ahead and connect for this particular notebook, we don't actually need a GPU. Hey, Xander, do you want to, um, you're sharing your presentation still. I think you oh, need am I sharing the presentation? Thanks, Maggie. Yeah. All right. Let me see. All right. How about now? Great. Thanks. OK, so all I did so far was I just copied and pasted the link up here. I signed in to Gmail. And I connected to an instance right over here. And as I was saying, we don't actually need a GPU. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to just run this installation step. This installation step is going to take a minute. So I'm just going to kind of walk us through what we're going to be trying to accomplish in this particular notebook and give people a chance to catch up. So the goal of this notebook, the notebook is entitled Active Learning for a Drifting Image Classification Model. So we're going to be dealing with an image classification model that has some kind of drift, and we're going to be using some kind of active learning workflow. The data that we're going to be dealing with comes from an image classification model that was trained to classify the action of people in photographs. So imagine that I give you a photograph of a person running. Our model is going to tell you, oh, the person in this photograph is running. And some other things, some other classes that it's going to try to predict will be things like, is the person sitting? Are they eating? Are they walking? Are they working on a computer? Are they talking on the phone, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition to the image data itself, and in addition to the ground truth and predicted values, we're also going to be downloading what are called embeddings. An embedding is just a vector representation of a piece of data. In this case, it's a vector representation of an image. And if we have good embeddings, that just means that similar images have close together or nearby embeddings, and dissimilar images have far apart embeddings. So if we have two images that are similar, like maybe an image of a person running, and another image of a person running. Um, we want their embeddings to be close together. And if we have two very dissimilar images, maybe a person, a picture of a person running and a picture of a person uh, working on the computer, we would like for those embeddings to be farther apart. Okay, so looks like my installation step ran. Let's go ahead and start running the notebook. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import the libraries that I need for my notebook. We're importing pandas. We're also importing Phoenix. We usually import Phoenix with the PX alias. And actually, let me zoom in for a minute here. Just hopefully that makes it a little easier to read. And we're also importing a couple of helper functions that are gonna, gonna let us visualize some of our data. All right, so now that we've imported all of those modules, let's go ahead and download the data itself. What this is doing is it's reading a couple of Parquet files from cloud storage, and it's loading our training and our production data into two pandas data frames. Now I'm going to go ahead and view the first few rows of one of my data frames. This is the training data frame. And let's just talk for a minute about some of the columns in this data frame. So we've got this column right here. This is the prediction ID column. A prediction ID is just a unique identifier for each prediction in your data set. 
We've also got a prediction timestamp column. The prediction timestamp is just referring to that moment in time at which our model made an inference. We've got the URL for each image. So this is the actual um, link to the image in cloud storage. And then this is the embedding data here in the image vector column. This is the embedding data I was talking about a minute ago. And as you can see, each entry in the image vector column is itself a vector that is describing the image located at the corresponding URL. And then we've got a couple more columns over here on the right. We've got an actual action and a predicted action column. The actual action column is our ground truth. The predicted action column is our predicted label. And let's go ahead and keep going. I'm going to now visualize my production data. And you can notice that my production data and my training data actually look quite similar. The only difference you'll notice is that my training data has ground truth. My production data has no ground truth. It has no actual action column. All right, so now that we've looked at the data frames, let's actually look at some of the images. These are images from my training data set. You can see some of the example pictures over here. Um, this is a picture of a person drinking. And if we look at the predicted and actual classes, um, the model correctly predicted that the person is drinking. Here's another image of people fighting. Again, it looks like the model got this one right. Here's a picture of some people clapping. Again, the model got it right. And a couple more pictures that the model is also predicting correctly. This one of people fighting, this one of someone sitting. OK, so that should hopefully give you an, uh, a sense of the data that we're dealing with. Let's go ahead and launch Phoenix now. In order to launch Phoenix, we're going to need a couple pieces of information. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to define this schema object. And what the schema is going to do is it's going to tell us what the columns of our data frame means. So this first line is just saying, OK, Phoenix, you should expect a column called prediction underscore TS. And this column is going to contain timestamps. You should also expect a column called predicted action. And this column is going to expect predicted labels. You should expect a column called actual action. This one will expect the, this column will contain the ground truth or the actual labels from our model. And then this last part right here is actually defining an embedding feature. An embedding feature is just the embedding vector data itself contained in the image vector column and the image itself or the link to the image in the URL column. And you can see this image embedding key right here is not actually one of the columns of our data frame. This is just a name that we're giving to our embedding that's going to show up inside of the app. So I'm going to go ahead and execute this cell. So now we've defined a schema for our training data set. Let's go ahead and do the same thing for our production data set. Again, this is exactly the same as the schema I just explained, except we don't have this actual action column in the schema. Now that I've defined my, now that I've downloaded my data into my data frames and I've defined these schemas, the next thing I'm going to do is define this data set class that's going to wrap those two things together. It's going to wrap together the data frame with the schema that describes the data and also names it. So in this case, I've named my two data sets production and training. And once that runs, I can actually launch Phoenix. And there we go. Phoenix is actually launched. So at this point, I have a couple of options for how to open it up. I can open it either inside of the notebook using this command. So this is what, what you saw on my slides um, a couple minutes ago. Um, but for this presentation, I'm actually going to open Phoenix in a new browser tab. That's just going to make it easier for everybody to follow along. And here we are. This is the home page for Phoenix. You can see. A couple of the fields that we just described in our schema, we've got our actual action here, our predict that prediction action here, and we've got some metrics for both of those fields. But the place where we want to go is we want to click into this image embedding page. This is where we're going to spend most of our time. And this should look pretty familiar. This is the same screenshot that I showed you a minute ago. You'll see once this part down here loads. But what you're seeing up here at the top is, again, it's measuring the drift of our production data over time. And the way that it does that 
is Phoenix is going to be looking at those embeddings that we just put into the, the app. And it's going to be seeing, on average, how much have the production embeddings drifted from the training embeddings. And you can see that we've actually detected some drift in this graph. There's this period right around here where the drift in the graph spikes. So something has gone wrong. Our data in production has drifted from the training data. And down here, what we're doing is we actually take the embeddings, we take those embeddings, which are high dimensional, and we actually reduce the dimensionality down to just three dimensions so that we're now visualizing our training data in purple and our production data in blue. So if you want to do this yourself, you can see down here in the bottom left corner, I'm able to toggle the data set that I'm looking at. So let's actually take a look at some of our training data. I've toggled down here so that I'm only looking at the training data. And I'm going to use this lasso in order to select this portion of my point cloud. And when I do that, I get actual examples from the point cloud down here in this panel at the bottom. Let's zoom out a little bit so I can see more of the examples at once. And just at a glance, I'm immediately able to see that all of the images in this cluster are images of people cycling. So all of these images are predicted and actual label cycling. OK, so it looks like, just from a quick spot check, it looks like our model is actually doing quite a good job on that particular cluster. Let's go ahead and check out a different cluster. I'm going to rotate my point cloud a little bit. <clears throat> Let me check out this cluster down here. Let's see what's in this cluster. OK. So here, this looks like one of the images I saw from my training data. And just at a glance, again, it looks like all of the examples in this particular cluster are examples of people drinking. OK. And maybe let's just do this one more time. Let me check out this region of my point cloud right here. All right, it looks like all of the examples here are images of people running. OK, so that should be pretty reassuring. That just means that we have good embeddings and that nearby embeddings are representing similar data points, um, similar images in this case. So that should be pretty reassuring. Um, but now, let's, let's go back and let's put ourselves back into the mindset of the engineer or the data scientist who created this model and suppose we're trying to maintain this model in production. We see that there's been some drift. Let's try to actually figure out why our model has drifted. What has caused the model to drift? To do that, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to zoom in to this time period right here. What's happening is the production data from this particular window of time we're actually only looking at that production data now. And that's what we're seeing down here. So we're no longer looking at, um, yeah, we're only looking at production data from this particular window of time when the drift is high. And not only am I able to actually manually select points with the lasso, I'm able to cluster my data automatically. And Phoenix is going to tell me, hey, these are the clusters that are potentially problematic. You need to take a look at these clusters. So this is the most problematic cluster right here. This is the second most, the third most. So if we actually zoom in to this region of our point cloud, let's see if we can actually notice what's going on. So you can see the reason that Phoenix is actually flagging these clusters as being potentially problematic is that unlike the rest of our point cloud, these clusters contain only production data. All the data points are blue. And the reason that's potentially problematic is that it means that our model is making inferences in production on data that it never saw during training. It never saw any similar data to these data points during training. So let's actually drill into these clusters and check out what's going on. I clicked on the top cluster there on the left. And the first thing that you'll notice is that these clusters are actually, the examples in this cluster are actually a little bit different from the examples from the training data set that we were looking at just a minute ago 
In particular, all of these images contain noise. These are noisy images. Let's check out the second cluster. Once again, I'm noticing noisy images. I'm also seeing a black and white image here, maybe another black and white image here. And let's check out one more cluster. All right, and once again, I'm not seeing the same kind of noise, but this time I'm seeing some blurry images in color. I'm also seeing blurry images in black and white. And it also looks like a couple of these have had noise added to them. So at this point, let's pause for a minute and let's recap what we've done with Phoenix so far. So far, what we've done is we have detected that there was a drift issue. And not only did we detect that there's a drift issue, we then had Phoenix tell us exactly where to look in our production data in order to find the examples that have drifted. And at this point, I feel pretty confident that I've figured out what is the, what is the actual cause of the issue. The cause of the issue is that we're seeing this grainy, noisy, black and white, um, blurred data in production that we never saw during training. So at this point, what we can actually do is we can come over here and click on export. And what that's going to do is it's going to save off the data in this cluster. And now I can actually come back to my notebook environment. I can scroll down for a moment. If I come all the way down to the bottom, let's execute this cell. What this cell is doing is it's actually loading in that exported cluster of data. And now I'm looking at that exact cluster of data here in my notebook. And let's go ahead and display some of those examples so we can take a look. So it looks like, yeah, these are the exact examples that I was seeing a moment ago. You can see that some of them are black and white, but they all have this noise added to them. So this is one application of Phoenix. You can use Phoenix in order to identify those problematic clusters in your production data, then you can export it. And at this point, our next step would be to actually label these data points and fine tune our model in order to improve the performance of our model on these grainy, noisy images. So that concludes the story that I wanted to tell you for the interactive portion of this workshop. Let me just pause for a minute and see if anyone has any questions. All right, I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat. Um, It looks like Robert asked, does Phoenix need to make any external calls outside of the scope of the local notebook? So Phoenix is an app that runs locally on your server. Whatever server is running your notebook, that's where Phoenix runs. It's not making any external API calls. OK, feel free to drop more questions in the chat. Um, oh, another question. Does Phoenix handle issues related to fairness and bias in machine learning models? Um, not at the moment, although I do, I would expect that at some point we will build that into the product. All right, awesome. It looks like we've got about five minutes left. So in the remaining five minutes, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and I'm gonna show you something really cool that we've been working on. I'm gonna demo some of Phoenix's capabilities for large language models and prompt response, pair, prompt response pairs. This is some functionality that we've just built into the app. So what you're seeing here is once again, um, a point cloud. And this time, the embedding data are embeddings not of images, but embeddings of pieces of text. And not just any piece of text, but they're embeddings of prompt prompts in the prompt response pairs. And the model that we're dealing with in this case is a large language model that we have instructed to take in news articles and to summarize those articles and return a short summary of about two to three sentences. So let's go ahead and actually explore some of this data. I'm gonna go ahead and toggle this graph at the top. Let's go ahead and explore some of this data. I'm going to grab this cluster right here. And let's take a look at some of the prompt response pairs. So where's a good one? This looks like a promising one. Back in January, 2012, Chelsea took three promising young boys, all brothers from their home in Graham Gardens. So if you're not familiar with Chelsea, Chelsea is a Premier League soccer team. Um, here is the 
Here is the summary. Jay De Silva is one of the three siblings that Chelsea took from their home. Okay, so this is an article about European soccer. Let's scroll down a minute. Here's another one. There are moments when Falcao uh, sets off those delayed runs in the bright red shirt of Manchester United. So again, Manchester United is a European soccer team. And here we have the summary of this article. This is a full length article, so it's pretty long. Hey, Xander, are you mm -hmm. trying to share something different than the oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Maggie. The image. Here we go. There we go. Okay. All right. So sorry about that. Um, looks like we got a couple minutes left. So I'll try to be brief. Um, basically, what I was saying is this is a point cloud. And now the embeddings represent not images, but prompt response pairs. And then I was just basically exploring different parts of the point cloud to see what the different points represent. So here we go. Here's a cluster of our point cloud. And let's actually inspect some of the prompt response pairs in this cluster. Here's one of the prompt response pairs. So again, the prompts in this case are the articles themselves that are being summarized by the large language model. And this one says, not many players have experienced Champion League success. Here's the summary. It's only a couple of sentences. So again, this is a cluster of, this is a cluster of, uh, articles about European soccer. And one thing that I can do, which is pretty neat, is that I can actually color my data sets by what is called Rouge score. So the Rouge score is an evaluation metric. It's basically going to tell you in this context, um, how, how good of a job did my LLM do at summarizing the article? And you can see that a higher Rouge score is a better score. This cluster over here has a lot of green points, which just means that it has a lot of um, it has a lot of good summaries. But if we take a look at this cluster over here, you can notice that this one has a lot of blue data points. So our model is actually struggling to summarize the articles in this cluster. And I can actually do the lasso here to inspect some of the points in this cluster. And immediately, I'm noticing something different about the points in this cluster. Namely, the points in this cluster are actually in a totally different language. They are articles and summaries in Dutch. So the basic story here is that we're able to, um, the story is we're able to actually color our data using this evaluation metric in order to identify that, okay, our LLM is actually struggling to summarize Dutch examples, struggling to summarize Dutch articles. So now once again, we've identified the root cause of the issue. All right, and with that, I think that basically wraps up the presentation. Um, really hope you enjoyed it. Once again, if you if you enjoyed the the workshop, please go ahead and check out um, our GitHub repo. Uh, we really appreciate uh, the support and leave us a star. Come join our Slack community. Thank you.